Um, another uh, welcome, warm welcome from my side. I'm Casper from Circle Economy. Uh, really happy to have everyone on board. And maybe also just to, as a welcome from your side, uh, it would be great to hear a bit in the chat already who's in the call, where are you calling from, which country or so, is it morning, is it evening, where you are. Um, we're really happy to have all of you join today and um, join us a bit in this circular economy workshop today. Um, maybe first a word of uh, thanks already. Good mornings coming in from the chat. Great to have everyone on board. Um, first, a quick word of welcome also from who we are here with today. Um, for that, start actually by handing over to Richard from the BMI Lab. Great, um, thank you. Give a brief introduction. Yeah, so I'm Richard. I'm from the Business Model Innovation Lab. We are a spin-off of the University of St. Gallen based on the business model innovation approach, the circular, uh, the St. Gallen Business Model Navigator. And we are basically for three years now also involved in the University of St. Gallen research about circular economy, especially at the interlinkage between circular economy and business models. Yeah keep it short for today because we have a lot of stuff we want to do with you. <laughs> I think Casper has a bit of internet issues as always in the right moments. Um, I think you're back Casper. All right, so um, I hope in the meantime, until he's back, I hope everyone has received our emails and also downloaded and maybe even printed out the working sheet um, because we would like you to use that um, and work with that. We will probably not be able to completely fill it out in the short duration we have, but we um, believe that it might be very well work out um, for you to start it now to get a bit of a uh, feeling for the tools and what we will do and how we work and then basically um, use that and maybe detail it even more after the workshop if you're if you're interested and, and want to do that. Casper seems to have been completely kicked out of the workshop which is a slight issue <laughs> because He's basically, and I can maybe maybe start with that. Apologies from, from my end. My ah. connection was dropped. I am back and Perfect. ready to share and have changed location. So hopefully we will be uninterrupted for the rest of the meeting. Uh, Perfect. But I... Then go go ahead with, with your introduction. Um, so continuing with the introduction from Circle Economy. Um, Circle Economy is an impact organization based out of uh, Amsterdam, and we follow the mission of accelerating a circular economy. And we do so uh, through a range of activities, mostly by providing research and public publishing that uh, through our different channels, but also really in uh, dedicated support through kind of advisory uh, projects to businesses, cities and governments that we work with. And apart from that, Circle Economy also acts as kind of a networking organization in a range of coalitions, um, communities of practice, and uh, other kind of the broader community that we engage with through our channels. Uh, me personally, Casper, I am a project manager, manager for Circular Business Innovation at Circle Economy, so really involved with uh, our individual client projects with um, corporates and businesses. Uh, looking to really build that strategic vision of a circular economy and understand how they can drive that forward based on kind of data-driven evidence. Um, and maybe to give a quick introduction into the session today um, and give some technical notes also, what we expect today, we have a packed agenda, um, it will be quite um, strict on time. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to just drop them in the chat box. We'll try to get back to them as soon as possible. And also, if there's any technical issues that you're facing, please feel free to let us know there. And then our colleague, Clara, will also help you there. Um, 
please uh, keep an open mind. This is a first for us in hosting such an open workshop. We've already experienced some um, network issues, but as we all, I think, have come to learn over the past year, vir virtual workshops bring their own kind of um, uncertainty and unexpe unexpected situations with them. And um, yeah, we, we're just looking to make it work and hope to really uh, provide you a lot of nice um, and useful input to uh, drive your respective uh, strategies and circular business models forward. Um, what will we do today? Um, first of all, in the first half, I will be giving a bit of an introduction into the circular economy. So we're all kind of on the same page of what, on what we're talking about. Um, we'll go a bit deeper into why one would want to go circular, what is the com commercial rationale behind it also, and how can you then start setting priorities for the innovation uh, that you plan to do on the circular economy. Uh, then I'll be handing over to um, Richard and Clara, who will guide us through a bit more of an interactive um, work session on circular business model innovation and building circular ecosystems. Um, yeah, the presentation will be shared afterwards, so um, we will keep you in the loop on that and also look forward to exchanging with you after the workshop if you have any questions. Um, so with that, I'd like to actually jump right in and start talking a bit about the circular economy as we see it as at circular economy and really make sure that uh, we all are on the same page on what we're talking about. And uh, I like to usually start by mentioning that the circular economy is a bit of a journey of transforming our current economic model. And that economic model is um, sort of the, the one that uh, we inherited from the recent history of economic and development, industrial development, um, within which we've seen, first of all, exceptional growth in, in prosperity and value. What we've, however, also seen is an exceptional growth in the extraction of materials and mass, and as we see also in carbon emissions. So what is this economic model that's at the back of it? And we see it, it's very much a model of taking resources from the earth, making products out, out of them, and turning those into products that we can use. And we certainly use a lot more than ever before. And the problem behind this is that a lot of these products then end up as waste and waste that we don't really know what to do with. Uh, a lot of times that ends up in uh, landfills or incinerated, polluting ecosystems and also really just being wasted resources. And that comes with problems, of course. In fact, this model is actually one that locks us into critical dependence on resources and increasing scarcity. So some of these resources are of course distributed quite in unequally around the globe, and especially when it comes to really materials that are essential to uh, feeding us, so phosphorus and an essential plant nutrient and fertilizer, but also the materials used really to power our energy transition, lithium and indium, these are uh, increasingly scarce and unequally distributed. So developing models of becoming more efficient and effective in the use and deployment of these resources is imperative. So we call this this old model that I was that we've inherited the linear economy. So one where we really source materials, we process them and put them through several steps of production. We ultimately sell them, we use them, uh, and then ultimately they end up as waste that is incinerated and landfilled. Now, what the circular economy aims to do is to ensure that actually this end, so the red dot, the waste is eliminated altogether. So resources are actually kept in use for as long as possible through different types of material cycles, ideally as close as possible to the use stage. So really that materials are maintained for as long as possible. If not, that they are reused, refurbished, and ultimately recycled to the base materials that can then be fed back into the, um, into the economy. In addition, we also see the circular economy as one that really maintains products and materials at their highest value. So it's not just a concept that only looks at materials, but also really at the idea of how does value evolve over the life cycle of products. And what we see on the left-hand side, so the linear in the linear example, is how 
In the current model, we build up a lot of value in our products by extracting them, manufacturing them, assembling, and then really marketing and retailing and selling it until that value peaks when it's, the product is in use. But oh, very briefly and quickly, we actually destroy value and even by design in terms of how we depreciate our products and, and buildings and equipment um, that it quickly loses the value that has when in fact we would want to keep that as high as possible to also keep, keep the attractiveness of, of maintaining that product high. And that's what the circular economy is all about in retaining value through repair and maintain schemes, reusing, refurbish and remanufacturing that you can ultimately always achieve the highest level of value along this value curve. Um, so what does that look like in practice? And for that, circular economy has defined this key element framework, which has kind of two main tiers of, of elements that we see to be crucial for enabling a circular economy. At the core of it, you see kind of three key elements, which are all about how can we start prioritizing regenerative resources or resources that are not from fossil sources and that can be naturally regenerated within reasonable amounts of time. How can we use what currently ends up as waste as actually a re resource? So how can we completely design out the concept of waste? And then lastly, uh, how can we stretch the lifetime of the things that we use for as long as possible? And there's a lot of different ways to get there. Um, at the core of it, for sure, is also the concept of design. It's, a, it's an idea of how can we redesign our products, our materials, but really also our business models and our processes, how they work. Um, so that is a key enabler, a key um, function of how we can make the circular economy work. But there's also more to that because there's really, how can we rethink the business model? How can we rewire the incentive schemes that currently uh, drive us to really focus on putting as many, as many materials through our economy rather than valorizing them at the most as possible. Um, there's elements of incorporating digital technology because that allows us to actually create a lot of efficiency and dematerialize things that usually had a um, really high material footprint. This workshop being all virtual is a perfect example of that. Um, in addition, we also have the concept of teaming up to create joint value because the circular economy is something you certainly can't achieve alone. It's about value chains coming together, even collaborating across value chains and rethinking how can we make the most of the resources that we have available to us. And lastly, to do that, we need to have a lot of knowledge. We need to understand the material flows that we're working with, all the options for business models that we can work with, and we need to be transparent about that. So that's kind of the last element I wanted to share. So why should we become circular? We already heard a bit, okay, there's some geopolitical scarcity and um, risk associated with staying linear and this, we know about some of the environmental impacts, but really why should your business become circular? And that's why I wanted to introduce a concept uh, that we term linear risk. So linear risks relates to the different risks associated with operating linear business practices. And with linear bis uh, business practices, you can understand really anything that relates to the depletion and use of non-renewable resources, of course, to set up a business model that prioritizes the throughput of sales of new products um, and designing products to not last, um, to monopolize and knowledge and IP, and actually to resist change and um, yeah, the, 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 the knowledge and science backing that. Um, and what, what type of risks arise from this? So we, we kind of see four main categories of risks that are associated with this. The first one being market risk. So market risk really relates to some of these geopolitical risks and resource scarcity risks that I've already mentioned um, that ultimately can cause great fluctuations in prices and uh, trade patterns uh, that ultimately can cause quite a bit of resource scarcity on a relatively short notice. Operational risks are what I guess we have experienced in the past couple of or one and a half years in a lot of supply chains where all of a sudden the global supply chains didn't fully work anymore. And uh, we, we experienced supply chain failures, products didn't reach their destination, internal process failures occurred, and we suddenly were dependent on having more resources available locally. 
Business risk is another one that really um, threatens the fundament of what the business model of a business is currently built around. So that is really changes in consumer demands. There's new technologies, new, new competitors and entering the market. Um, there's also legal risks, and that relates to this, the tightening regulation, for instance, on which chemicals can be used, uh, but also things like a carbon tax or other environmental taxes coming up that ultimately can uh, cause a lot of risk of litigation or having to pay a lot of fines and penalties. So um, to start getting a bit more interactive, I would really like to invite you to a Minty poll, poll and maybe uh, Clara, you could quickly help us by putting the link and the code into the chat and then everyone can join this poll um, because I'd really like to openly ask you which linear risks do you feel are currently the most relevant for your business? And I'm happy to draw up the slide again as we um, then present and see which answers are coming in. Um, yes, thanks, Clara. So, yeah, we're really curious to hear what kind of linear risks are you potentially already experiencing within your businesses. I'll quickly draw up the right screen to share with you what the outcomes of that will be. Is everyone able to enter the mirror, uh, sorry, the mentee? Perfect. Thanks, Tatiana. So um, think of really anything you can, it's fine to also just put down one of the four categories. So market risks, legal risks, um, operational or business risks. But if you have even more specific, so I see new consumer demand, business risk, yeah, changing regulations, um, coming up and business risk is certainly one that is occurring quite often. More and more coming in, business as usual, resource depletion. A lot of Demand, customer demand, and changes to customer demand. Yeah. Yeah. Regulations is definitely a big one. Operational. Technology. Complacency. Interesting. So with that, I think I actually would like to go into another, oops, sorry, another poll to really understand, um, yeah, exactly. How do we assess the different risks? Which ones are the most relevant ones? And there I see business risks already. So I see already some of you answered this. Great. So that basically business risk is the driver pretty much matches what, what we see. And when we talk to, to many companies that that is the number one for them and the number one driver here. I'm surprised almost a bit that legal risk is, is relatively low still, because of course we see a lot of policy change actually quite, especially recently we see in Germany, but also yesterday news in the uh, in the Netherlands of how companies and uh, countries even are um, by courts asked to increase their uh, climate change um, ambitions and actions. 
Shell, um, right? <laughs> Shell, yeah. Yesterday it was the ruling on Shell to reduce by 45% until I think 2045 also, or 2030. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, let's let's keep it at that. Very interesting insight. Thanks for sharing, everyone. Um, and I will go back to the presentation because, of course, um, this is a discussion um, which, which is very much about the doom and gloom of inaction and business as usual. But um, really, the narrative that I would like to strike today is also really that of opportunity because the circular economy in, in being in, in a concept that is built around how we can keep the economy alive and how can we reinvent it is really one of opportunity and how we can look forward. So uh, what I want to focus on now is really how a circular economy makes business sense when we take into account the different angles that are actually part of that. And for that, we've um, outlined this value driver framework, um, which kind of clusters around three core drivers of value, which is how the circular economy can en enable additional strategic growth of your business, how it can enable you to achieve even higher operational efficiency by reducing also the inefficiency of that waste ultimately is, um, how you can build organizational legitimacy externally and with all your stakeholders that you work with, but also resilience. How can you build resilience into your business model that you are able to withstand shocks, um, external shocks. And these, these drivers are, uh, if we start from top and then kind of go around to enter new markets, so that's really a growth driver that you can, you're able to target with new circular solutions, markets that you weren't maybe able to target before um, through service models that uh, are now, now open up your product to a new customer segment. Um, you're able to reduce costs because you're able to reduce the amount of materials that need to go into your product. Um, and you're also, of course, as we've already seen, able to reduce quite a bit of risk and start future-proofing your business for the decades to come. And that also relates to triggering new innovation capacity because it's really a whole different way of thinking as we've kind of seen in this value of how we think about the value creation in our business and how innovation connects to that. An important one I think that is almost not talked about enough is the idea of how also you know every every company is in competition to attract the best talent on the labor market and what we've seen for a while is that um purpose-driven company companies with an idea for the future um that are in compliance with kind of the key uh, environmental and social challenges that we face they're able to attract and retain talent much better um, in the circular business model, we also see that customer value can be delivered and extended much better because um, you, you often build closer relationships to customers through the emotional bond to the product, but also through long-term engagements, through service agreements. Um, and lastly, you're able to align with public expectations. So these type of scandals that we see with some of the businesses that maybe form a bit more the linear um, linear. Uh, history, even though there's also a lot of movement in those, of course, um, but reducing the risk of these types of scandals affecting your business. So in now trying to engage you a bit more, I would like to again ask you to go to Menti, and I actually see that the code is not the right one. Let me quickly provide you with the right one. Um, so it is in fact going back to menti.com, but this is the code. Uh, Clara, if I could ask you again, actually I can edit myself also. And then it hopefully is easy to add because I'd really like to understand which one of these value drivers do you think is most relevant to your organization? And also, if there's any questions already um, on these, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm happy to also explain a bit more on what's behind them.
I can see the idea of reducing risk and aligning with public expectations really is also still at the forefront. Um, let's see if, if more people also see, oh, there's the greater customer value and innovation capacity uh, are also quite up there, which I guess is a bit more of the opportunity narrative. Very positively forward thinking. I like that. Yeah. So if you have asked these questions before, do you have seen vastly different results before, Casper? Or um, yeah, not necessarily the reduced risks is always um, the front running one, but I think it, it, it shows that we have uh, given quite a narrative on the linear risks before, um, which I, I do agree. And I think maybe also recent, recent experience has just taught us how real these risks are of interrupted supply chains, of changing regulation. Um, and well, um, I see also Valentin asking a question, what about doing good for the planet? Um, absolutely, that's, that's one of the key drivers, I think that probably most of us that engage with this topic feel. Um, but I, um, now we here try to really focus on the commercial drivers, uh, but maybe what it, what it also um, is important to, to mention is that this idea of attracting new talent is exactly, is exactly that point of many people want to actually um, work for the good of the planet. So um, hopefully that- I think it's off. important to, to, to realize that um, oftentimes if you say it is very important, especially for the, for the employees and for the people in there, but um, as a sole driver for companies to change in our current system, it's probably not enough. That's why we assume this change now is also based on, on business imperatives and, and all these other drivers. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone again for participating in this. I think it's a really interesting picture. Um, hopefully, yeah, I think that's something we can also share afterwards what the results were. Mm. That's something that you would like to also take into your respective organizations. Um, now for the last 15 minutes of my part, um, let me quickly go back to the presentation um, because one, one more point that I want to focus on is then now that we know why we want to focus on the circular economy, how do we get started? How do we set priorities for circular innovation? And um, that, at that point, circular economy usually takes the approach, okay, we need to really understand how does our economic system, how op operational system, our business system, our value chain, how does it work? And recognizing that the circular economy is a concept of material and energy flows that we need to understand of the full life cycle of products, but also really the full value chain. So uh, what you see here is an example from a former project of ours in the construction materials sector. So with the Rockwool Group, um, uh, where we really mapped all the material flows associated with their stonewall insulation materials from really the origin. So is it, where is it sourced? Is it bio-based materials? Is it virgin materials or secondary materials? through uh, the different categories of inputs, the manufacturing stage, how it ends up in the built environment being used, and then ultimately um, at the end of life being recycled or what, what, what different types of waste management treatment um, options are out there. And I think it's really important to acknowledge this idea of life cycle um, or material flows over the life cycle of products. And that's something that I also wanna take forward. First, I wanna show you another example um, from a very different organization. So this is from retail actually, because also retailers of course have um, systems that they, operational systems that they're embedded in and maybe they're not producing themselves, but they're sourcing of course, a lot of materials and then also distributing them through their retail network. And also they have then associated with that a lot of waste streams. Why did I show you these examples? Because, um, once we start collecting these um, flow, these this information about the flows, and we start understanding really the the life cycle um, material and energy flows of our business, we can start measuring how circular we are. 
and we can start defining indicators of um, where we can also start improving on that. So um, in the field of metrics, and it's really a, an evolving field of circular economy metrics, um, we see different types of metrics. We see, for instance, the big headline indicators that gives us an idea of how circular is a company, is a country. Um, so that's just kind of a percentage circularity, but also we can dive deeper into really understanding, okay, along the value chain, along the, the system that we've shown, how um, does the company perform at the specific levels where, where circularity becomes really relevant? And of course, those are different for every business. Um, what I just wanted to share also in the, in the creation of a circular business model, these metrics can be used at different stages. So at the start, they might be used to just create awareness and set a baseline. Uh, they might be used to identify and track opportunities, but also really to then start comparing them against each other and understand what are the drawbacks and benefits of them and how can we even build a business case around them. And then lastly, they may even be used to really validate and share your results ultimately even in reporting. So um, what do we need for that? Of course, we can only create these metrics if we start collecting data. And that data um, ha takes different forms. So for instance, in the example of Rockwell now here, we see that there's data on the material extraction. So what type of materials are extracted and what ecosystems are they extracted from? So is it biomass? Is it mined materials or is it secondary materials? Um, what is the production and processing data? So how, what, what are actually the production volumes? How are the products assembled? And uh, what also production waste is created during production? And then very importantly, of course, the data on how is the product actually used? What is the usual duration of a lifetime? And um, what type of waste maybe also arise during production? But then that is also mainly covered under the end of life data. Um, so really, what are the waste volumes generated by products uh, or by businesses and how is that waste handled? And then in terms of the secondary materials, we, can, we start measuring that through cycling flow data or secondary material flow data. And um, very importantly, of course, we can't ignore the topic of energy because very much so still our energy is based on fossil resources and those are also materials that have a material footprint. So um, what can we do with these, this type of information? We can start calculating metrics. We can calculate an overall material footprint. We can start understanding better the efficiency of our processes. We can start understanding the life cycle of our products and how we could potentially extend things, make them last longer, how we can integrate multiple use cycles, um, how we can better understand the end of life of our products, how that can be optimized, how resources can maybe be sorted better to then ultimately end up as secondary materials again, which is then our secondary input metrics. And as well, we have renewable energy metrics because they tell us something crucial about what the material footprint of our energy supply actually is. So um, I believe most of you have received a working sheet also prior to this workshop where um, we have outlined also um, a visual like this, outlining really what type of um, information, what type of data is currently being collected. So what I would like to do first of all is to understand already, um, well, may may maybe let's actually start with understanding system boundaries because that's something that I haven't, um, haven't explained properly yet. In an analyzing our these systems, we need to understand really what is our um, level of control over that system. So um, where do we really operate the processes and where are we just buying things from a supplier or selling something to a distributor? So where do we need, where do we have influence but not full control? So that's kind of the first task to really look at where do we have full control and where do we have influence because that really tells us something about how much impact we can also have on these points in the supply chain so if i start explaining now on the example of rockwool um, they had immediate control over really which inputs they bought and uh, but then of course they were dependent on the market and um, how they manufactured their materials when it came to use and end of life, that was already 
somewhat beyond their control. So they were trying a lot to get materials back, but that wasn't all possible because they were subject to legislation, to the existing waste management um, management processes in, in the respective countries. And also when it comes to where the materials exactly come from, they usually source those externally and um, needed to then also ensure through their suppliers that they can be better. So for each of your businesses, it would be really interesting to understand what your uh, system boundaries are, where's your sphere of control, and where's your sphere of influence. Unfortunately, we won't be able to share much on that with each other, but I hope this is a, a helpful trigger also for your own discussions internally to use this worksheet and maybe even start thinking more, okay, where can we, what can we change and where can we do so? If you do feel like dropping a note on um, on what you think you can change best in the chat, please, uh, we'd really welcome that. Um, uh, we'd be really interested to, to see that shared. Um, but maybe before, I would also like to touch upon the point of data, because it's interesting to, with in mind where you have control and where you have influence, to understand what of this type of data are you actually collecting already. Um, and to Zoe, I think the, the worksheet is available. I think it was sent already, but we can also resend it again with the presentation afterwards. Um, but yeah, the point being that it would be really interesting to understand which of this type of data are you already collecting? Or um, are you aware of this from, from, your, um, from your organization, which data is collected? Or where do you wonder if we, you might have access to it if you're not collecting it yourself? Um, so to also fill that in on the worksheet. Um, and if you don't have it in front of you, we will send it to you. Feel free to maybe already share in the chat what type of data, if you have any data on material flows and, and energy use available, or if that's something that your company is not collecting at all. Um, I think that would be interesting to hear as well. Okay, there's someone looking for the retail worksheet example as well. Uh, I think that's something we can provide as well. Um, yeah, giving you another moment to just also um, put this into your worksheet. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, And otherwise, oh, I see I can actually delete annotations. <laughs> Interesting point. If you, for example, see, um, as Rajul is pointing out, that the data is not being collected at all. Um, what, from your experience, Kasper, are first good steps to start collecting that data? What are the reasonings you could put forward in your company? Sorry, what, what are the um, reasons why companies don't collect data or? Well, how could you argue the, uh, within your company, for example, that you should start collecting that data? Um, well, I think it, it comes back to the opportunities and risks that we discussed, right? And, and materials are certainly at the core of that. I think um, also more and more, we get a better understanding of how our consumption of materials directly uh, related to, for instance, um, emissions that we have uh, from, from our business and how if we want to reduce emissions, if we want to achieve our um, climate targets, um, we also need to understand the full scope of, of, of emissions and materials and our material use certainly uh, caters to that. And then there's really also, of course, the, um, the economic aspects of what, what the opportunities are behind actually becoming more efficient in the use of resources, how um, your your the data about how your consumers use your product and how long it lasts is actually critical to making your products better and improving the the user experience so um yeah i think there's really a range of um rationales why, why this data is critical but um 
I, I completely understand also how it's how it's not common yet so much to, to start collecting data and asking for data that is beyond your control and therefore also oftentimes beyond your responsibility. So once something becomes waste, it it oftentimes is not recorded in data because it doesn't have immediate value and it's not necessarily always the responsibility of the company to take that over, if it, especially if it's not covered by an extended risk, um, producer responsibility scheme. Yeah, and I think Finland makes a good point here that maybe they don't collect the data because they haven't had enough damage or so. But on another point here, for example, there are increasing number of companies, for example, um, Salesforce, who basically now ask their supply chain to basically collect that data so that they can start um, being more green and also, also showing and highlighting that on their end, yep. which means that increasingly also more B2B companies will have to start collecting that data. So it's becoming business as usual, if, if, if you want to say in, in management language. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so th this is actually what I will be closing for um, my part of the presentation today. What I want to, of course, uh, still close on is kind of how this all comes back to the, the elements of a circular economy and how it should help us set priorities. So hopefully you all also got an understanding now for how different material flows and the, 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 their volume in your system also means that you might have different priorities in terms of prioritizing regenerative resources. For instance, if you're completely powered by fossil energy and all your uh, materials come from uh, virgin resources, then you can more and more using secondary materials moving also into the waste, um, using waste as a resource and uh, incre increasingly using regenerative biomass products um, that are sustainably grown. And uh, how you can start thinking of, okay, if you stretch the lifetime, if you extend uh, your, your product life cycle duration more, how that also has repercussions on the overall amount of products that you will need to produce. And servicing those products will actually be the guiding um, driver of value creation rather than selling new products and materials. Um, as we then also look into the outer tire, tire of, I think, what, what makes up a functioning business model around these, um, I feel that's the perfect bridge to you, Richard, to actually help us understand a bit better what will be the key elements that form a successful circular business model? How can you start ideating and innovating and brainstorming towards that? And how can you then build an ecosystem towards that? Um, can I hand over with to you then? Perfect. So um, thanks for, for, for handing that over. And that's exactly basically what what also makes our collaboration work, which is why BMI Lab and Circular Economy are collaborating on this now, is because while Circular Economy coming from the top, from strategy and sustainability, and really is able to to measure a lot in that direction, the business model innovation lab is coming from the business model design, um, implementation, and innovation angle. And so, what we have asked us three years ago is basically how do we bring circular economy and that business model innovation aspect together? And as um, Kasper has said before, we see more and more pressure on companies to change now and to change for them means to change products, but also more increasingly to change business models here. So as a first intro here, what is a business model? We use the business model triangle basically. Um, as a very high level and easy to understand approach. In the center, we have who, who is your target customer and segment and what is, are their biggest problems or needs here? Um, what is what you offer as a company or within your business model, your value proposition, your products and services that you, that you offer to these customers? And the how dimension, the, the third dimension basically ask how do you generate and deliver that value proposition, which activities, resources, part, and partners are important to create that value. And at least, last but not least, most importantly, profitability. How do you capture the value you generate? What are main costs and revenue sources? And when you look at that, and that's been the standard description, even though in much more detail in other kind of business model concepts, that's the overall viewpoint. What you see is that there's nothing to be said from externally of the company. 
nothing to, to be seen here. And more interestingly, even when you read about it uh, in the business model world, uh, when people talk about sustainable business models, they usually mean long lasting business models that generate a long lasting profit. So that are stable basically, not the sustainability we are talking about right now. So when we started on the collaboration with the University of Van Gogh, we asked how we could we bring that together. And one of the most simple and, and well-known concept is obviously the triple bottom line, where you look at people, planet and profit and, and the intersection for them. And when you, when you see these two concepts, it's quite easy to understand, okay, we can really merge them. Meaning if we look at whom we are offering a certain product, what, and how we create that product, we quite easily see what will be, what is the impact on the planet that we have when we produce that. Um, on the other hand, when we look at what we create and what, what's the value we generate with that for whom, we see the impact on the people and also how we create it and how we let people pay for that, what's the revenue model, we see how that impacts our profit. And the important part with that concept is that we now have, have something which we can use to design or also analyze our current business model to basically, because what you don't measure, right? And what you don't account for, you don't, you don't, you cannot change. And that's why that is basically the, the, the foundation to, to improve upon what you have right now. And what we want you to do today and now, oh, more detailed planet means what is the impact on the environment basically and what is the impact on people and society, obviously. And um, as we want to have that as more of a work workshop than a webinar, um, kindly get your working sheets out now again, because we want to start um, by having a qu quick session, six minute session with you, where you basically try to note one business model. It can be a business model of your company or your business unit. Usually companies have multiple business models. So maybe think about the business model that you are most familiar with. Maybe if you're responsible for, for a product, take that business model. If you're working in consultancy or so on, think about the one business model from a client that you know best, or if you have no relationship at all, we would suggest maybe think about IKEA, which we all know, their traditional business model, and think about that. And take, take the sheet, the 2.1 sheet, where you see the sixth dimension of the circular idea sheet. So what, who, what, how, value, planet and people, and try going through the dimensions, try to describe that model right now. Do it basically one to two post-its. We cannot go into too much detail now, but uh, we would love basically to, to have having you thinking in business models, think about it, and also think about the implications. So six minutes uh, starting now. For those, I don't want to interrupt too much, but for those who are not, do not have something in mind, we want to talk a bit about the one from IKEA to give you a bit of a guidance, but um, please also feel free to, to mute me if you want to focus on, on your own business model right now. It really is important and helps to think through the dimensions, starting with who, to have a high level understanding, because when we talk to people, everyone basically, at a company, it's the same business unit, kind of describes their own business model differently. And it's important to have a common foundation here to understand what you want to change and where, how you can assess, assess, assess basically what you have right now. So for IKEA, customers are mostly coast conscious. It's also small businesses and mainly families and students who initially um, where the main focus group of IKEA nowadays, it's much broader, it's much more well known, but um, price was the initial trigger for, um, for their consumers, which was the focus on, on, their, on their product basically and on, on their products and how they handle the products and how they basically set up their whole business model.
thinking about the what dimension. So what is your value proposition? What products and services do you offer? Um, it's basically affordable and functional home furniture, meaning um, initially when they came to market, you had a very, very pricey furniture and they were the first to offer a really cheap one in the do-it-yourself style, which we now really completely um, think about when talking about IKEA, as well as their specific shopping experiences, meaning their restaurants that are included and start half an hour earlier than the shop by itself so that people can have a breakfast and then start their shop shopping experiences the way they design their stores and nowadays also the way they basically um, offer their products online and their catalog obviously which was in the early years the main focus and is now basically on the website so how do they do that exactly by offering their stores creating their local stores their restaurants and their online presence right now. We see they are very strong in advertising and marketing their catalog, but also one could say humorful at least um, um, PR campaigns and uh, advertisements. Very important to have that reduced or low costs. They focus on very high volume um, of their products as well as very low cost materials. Also improving their lo logistics by inventing these flat packs we know with them, having more efficient um, shipping and, and logistics with the do-it-yourself aspect as well. And nowadays also offering assembly and delivery services, especially for more advanced furniture like whole kitchens nowadays. So they really also moved forward with their, with their models from smaller and simpler furniture to more advanced ones. And how do they generate their value? Basically selling the furniture, accessories and more, also offering the food in the, in the restaurants. Um, for example, in Germany, IKEA is one of the biggest um, fast food um, um, companies overall, and also having their assembly and delivery fees, obviously. Reduced their cost on the other hand side, as I said before, due to the high volume, Due to the self-service, we you know also from the from the shop and store system, as well as volume and materials, basically. What they have seen and changed now on the environmental side, basically they due to their large volume and due to their, their mass production, this is always difficult to get it right, right? Cheap furniture means short-lived furniture mass produced and having such masses of products out there really runs perpendicular kind of to to circular economy principles and sustainability principles but at the same time they really start to to improve on that working with um, certified or recycled wood and materials uh, increasing that and also having sustainability requirements for suppliers in place trying to more and more leverage their position as one of the biggest furniture um, producer in the world to, to drive a change. But initially, really, really issue with changing the furniture world from a very expensive, very long lasting furniture that is also resold to a short lived um, mass market basically. But on the other hand, that helped people who use that um, furniture to afford more and then by that help people to with their home and the situation. And in the past, they also had basically uh, prison and child labor issues. So as always, a big, a big company cooperation with, with quite some issues on that side. So I hope you could take the time um, to also note down your, your own your own business model concept, high level, basically um, focusing on the planet and people um, point of view, which is not often done at that level to better understand how that business model works and how these dimensions also interact, basically. Next up, and we move you from that foundation, based on that level of understanding, um, the next point would be to create solutions and new ideas 
and what we know from innovation practice was what works are patterns. So we've created an, a collection of, of patterns based on more than 250 successful, sustainable and circular cases um, that highlight with what kind of logic these companies and businesses work so that you can take them and apply them to your company or case in that case. So the idea is we will show you these pattern cards. Now you have them on, the, on your working sheet and ask you to apply them. So how would your company, how would IKEA basically use that pattern, could apply that pattern to its current logic to change that. What's nice about that is that it helps, it has covered a wide range. While we only show you four today, there are 40 overall that we have identified and that help you to make sure that you take a view from, from all angles, from very different perspectives on your business to see what you could change. And what's important with that, today we do it due to the number of participants all on your own, um, but it's still important when you start brainstorming and ideally do that in the future on your own business model with some colleagues because the more prospect perspective you combine the better. Um, you should care for some rules here. So when you're in a brainstorming mood, you should share any idea that comes to mind. So when you're thinking about how can I apply that pattern or logic to my business model, write down everything that your mind comes up with. Use it as an association machine, basically. If you're many people, build on the idea of others, but it's very important to avoid criticism. So not think, think not, oh, that idea is crazy or that wouldn't work out because just write it down, be open for it now and, and, and use that and get everything out of your head, basically. That's why you want to strive for quantity. Get as many ideas out as possible. You will sort the worst ones out later on, but oftentimes by staying open, you create ideas based on the, the initial ones, the first ones, and develop them, and you never know what's gonna come out, right? Stay focused on the card and pattern and explaining it in a group, but basically writing it down. You have it in your head right now, but you need to note it somehow. And um, if you are stuck or if the pattern doesn't work because not every company can apply every pattern that doesn't work, move on to the next one. So for that session now, we want you to create these business model ideas using the pattern. You have your working sheet. We will also show the pattern on the slide here. And you have four minutes per card to ideate. Just think, how can you apply that pattern to the business model you just now Create it. Do that by reading through the pattern, through the description, and the two examples that are provided here, and then apply that. Think of, think of the brainstorming rules I had. I, I mentioned just now, and the time will run over. You will see here. Mm. And if there are any questions right now during that, if you have some issues here, um, just write me in chat and I will help you. So we will start with waste as input now for four minutes. Read through the pattern and think how could your company or IKEA use waste as an input. And if you have a good idea, for example, for IKEA or your own company that you like based on that pattern, feel free to write it down in chat. We can, we can discuss it and basically gather them for, for the next step here.
what also happens quite often is that initially you have some ideas, one or two, and then you kind of run dry, especially when doing it alone, right? Um, force, try to force yourself to think it through. Um, even if you have a minute or so, not, not, you don't get any idea, stay with it. Oftentimes, the more disruptive ideas come up if you stay focused on that for a bit longer and try to kind of force yourself to come up with ideas here. Richard, shall we start a little bit of a brainstorm on IKEA <laughs> already here? I was just thinking it would be cool if IKEA had like a collection of products that are made from products that come from the, like waste products from the region, you know, from because they're stored or like uh, the factories are, I guess, often surrounded by other types of industries. So if they have like a local circular collection or something like that. Yeah, using byproducts from local production. Yeah, totally, totally. And it's like a, got a nice uh, touch to it of showcasing people the, the waste from their own region. Yeah. Yeah. Carla, feel free to. to uh, <laughs> okay. Hey. Hey. I, I, I thought I pitched in. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. An idea for IKEA, maybe a little uh, inspired from Fruit Leather Rotterdam. I mean, in Germany, it's that they have a huge um, um, food um, apartment, a food place where you can eat a lot of food. And they probably also have a lot of waste or residuals from that. So maybe they could use that and not just like the food, but also all the packages the food comes in. Maybe they can, yeah, play with that a bit and design something out of that, especially for example, if you think that you get get like paper and maybe even plastic, you could um, shred all of it and make reusable um, geschirr, um, like plants mm -hmm. and drinks. And then it, you could even sell it where you get the food from there and you could promote like no plastic using um, plates when you go picnic or something like that. And That's wonderful. Good, very good idea. Thank you. For Thank you for sharing because um, with a company that big, it's quite easy to get, create your own loop within your company. And and having having those two aspects, like the food aspect and the product aspect, it might might makes a lot of sense to create a new product line, maybe even completely based on that. Lovely idea. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Sure. So next one for now, um, dematerialization. I'll give you a, a minute, and then maybe. Kasper and I can also start brainstorming with you. So feel free to also raise your hand again if you have a good idea. And probably I could read it, right? So dematerialization aims to create products that require less or no material, reducing the resources needed for production and logistics. This can be achieved by intelligent product design that allows the removal of certain materials or parts from a product while maintaining its functionality. So we see a vacuum here. We see many vacuumers nowadays don't use their bags that are thrown away after use and have reusable plastic bags or containers in that case. Examples here are Blueland, who have developed a household cleaning solution using um, small um, tablets, basically. You have, you have a pill and you put that into a glass bottle, use tap water. And that way they really reduce logistic costs because you only ship the pills anymore. You reuse your glass containers instead of throwing away your polymer bottles um, and thereby have a lot of positive impact. Another example of dematerialization is basically coming down to a mono material. So Adidas Futurecraft Loop is 
not only in the beta phase right now, but also out, out right now, their first running shoe, which is made solely from one polymer material. And that allows them basically to very easily recycle, shred and recycle it and make the same basically or another shoe out of the same material based on, on that shoe completely. So how could your company or IKEA um, use that pattern within their company and to their business model? What I'm often thinking about is also packaging, right? Basically trying to remove packaging and, and um, further distract it. It's always an issue with having, um, you don't want to destroy your product. So packaging has a lot of, of, of um, yeah, value there, but overall more and more um, offerings are delivered, right? So you could probably try to change your delivery system um, when you and when it's ordered online, where you don't really need as much um, packaging because you can transport it in a different way in your own vans or, or something like that. Other ideas, Kasper? Well, I, I think one one that I have is already in in action at IKEA or something at least something they're working on with having like their, their showrooms virtual and um, also enabling that people through augmented reality can really already see what what the um, furniture would look like in in their house um, which would yeah also enable I guess having fewer sh or smaller showrooms and also a smaller um, smaller warehouses yeah totally or at least um yeah more centralized the logistics and, and make it more efficient basically exactly good point they basically dematerialize with that concept the whole store system <laughs> wonderful any ideas in chat ah didn't know that clara an audiobook yeah, right, Eleonora. Repack is a very good example. Um, it's not exactly dematerialization, but that's the thing. When you think about these things, we often say in an ideation, it doesn't matter at all if it's really to that pattern. Repack basically is a startup that uses um, plastic based um, packaging, which is reusable. So you get your stuff after you take it out, and afterwards you can fold it together into a, a letter size and put it into, into the postal system again. It gets used again. So that could be an alternative, maybe even for spare parts and, and other things that IKEA could offer, which is basically based on e-commerce. So let's move on to the next pattern. Performance-based contracting, a tougher one, at least for the IKEA example. So performance-based contracting enables companies to offer their customers a comprehensive value proposition where payment is based on the outcome of performance instead of purchasing the product. This way it transfers the ownership from, from uh, the, the transfer from producers to users is avoided because I as a producer stay as the owner of the product and basically sell the performance of the product. Very well known example is Signify, formerly Philips Lightning, who offer um, a whole lightning infrastructure. So instead of buying the, the light bulbs and all that stuff, they do that for you as a service, obviously in the business to business area. And what they did basically is say, saying, we are more efficient. So you pay us based on your savings compared to the level before. So it reduces energy consumption for the consumers, aligns Philips and customers' goals basically, because now we move away and that is a decoupling what, what we want to achieve um, from, from value generation from resource, because instead of having short-lived light bulbs that need to be changed a lot and thereby bought again and again, now the goal of for Philips is to have 
even more long, long lasting um, light bulbs and in, uh, light infrastructure because they need to uh, maintenance it, repair it, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they have more benefits the longer their systems last right now because they are based, they are get paid, paid based on the performance their system attains. Another one is Xerox with photocopiers where it's basically paid per print or copy, uh, achieving basically that same alignment between um, and decoupling from strict sales of a product towards um, maintaining ownership, being paid on based on the performance, and therefore using the products much longer and keeping them, uh, them alive much, much longer and better. So how could that be applied to your company? And also maybe some ideas for IKEA right now. Finley asked the question here, how is it different from a rental model? Um, the difference is basically that you pay then based on the performance. So for Signify, it's, it's, it's calculated based on your last year's energy consumption and the price that is paid now, and um, they get paid a share of that. It also implies the kind of um, target goal that you, that you yeah go for um, ahead of that or an, an advantage in advance and so that basically um, the performance becomes even more important if you if you rent it and it is destroyed um, or doesn't work anymore um, you rent a, a, a new one it's kind of um, closely aligned but the, the, the difference here is that um, Xerox for example might make more money based on the on the copy uh, number of copies you do while renting is basically flat on, on that value generation part. All right. Do you have any ideas for IKEA, Casper? <laughs> A hard one. And maybe maybe for you, if you use these, these cards or do these kind of things, it's also important to, to really force yourself to try to come up with something for, for IKEA here which is obviously not easy. The comfort as a service, I'm not sure if that's easy to measure. <laughs> what they do um, is, for example, um, furniture as a service, which is not exactly performance-based in that com concept, but rather closer to as Xinglin said, a subscription model, where you basically pay monthly for, for um, your thing where they started using that in a in a student um, with a with student part. And yeah, so last one. Prosumer, maybe you read through it. Um, I think in the sense of being on time, we will probably move forward a bit, but it's interesting. Oh yeah, true, true Imke. Just, just as the pointer here, um, digitalization is not necessarily dematerialization. That's completely true. You always have to have to assess it. That's that's the issue with a lot of um, um, rebound effects, for example. So you really need to assess if you digitalize something completely, is it really more sustainable or not? If you want to achieve that, basically. And yeah, liability is is within the contract. So prosumer. Um, and this, because we want to finish, I think we can skip that. If you do it on your working sheet, feel free uh, to, to moving forward with that and also trying it out later on and then continuing later on. So I would move forward to the next step and that's talking about circular ecosystems. Because one thing we see a lot is uh, there's a lot of talk about circular business models. And for us, that is while in more more catchy word a slight misconception because for us um, really there's not one business model that can create a circular economy if you look at the dimensions we had it's from one company it's one logic one business logic but that is only in the rarest cases is one company able to provide everything that is needed to close that material loop to not 
have a have a waste aspect, but to recover it because it's oftentimes not in their core competency. So therefore, circular economy requires interaction uh, between different actors and their business models. So we have along the value chain a number of business models, and they basically form an ecosystem that provides the value to the customer. That means you have a number of companies from very different industries, and oftentimes when we work with businesses and companies, these are very far away from their usual business because normally it's, okay, I sell my product, maybe have some after-sales services, but then that's it. And now thinking about refurbishing and um, having new partners who do that for you because you haven't done that before, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's very different for and very dif difficult for companies. And then also engaging the partners is a big task here, um, having different timelines and therefore orchestrators are needed. So you need that company maybe your company that really drives the ecosystem that helps um, and aligns all the participants and partners. You oftentimes have a situation where maybe you, if you go for the partly a recycling route, maybe not much changes for the recycler business model, but sometimes it does because you need no new technologies. So you need to find specific partners who help with that. And then you have to think about how long is the lifetime and the life cycle of my, my product. And that changes a lot. It's thereby you have a high complexity, um, which is why we have a circular canvas and you have that on your working sheet as well. You can download it via the QR code, which helps to initially put your ideas on that canvas. So you have the make, use and recover phase. It's all around one product or shared value proposition with the important integral and strategic factors such as design, financing, packaging, logistics, and metrics that are all needed to really drive such an ecosystem forward. And what we do in the first step is basically use the ideas you generated beforehand, put them on the, on the canvas, and try to generate an ecosystem that way by combining your, the ideas you had, maybe even multiple uh, ecosystems. So for that session, uh, we would like you to, to start by using the ideas you generated on your working sheet and trying to put them in the, in the right places on your writing it down for, for that example um, on, on the circular canvas. The goal is here to basically create a full circle. What usually happens is that you have a number of your ideas that you like most and you try to make them work together. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes, more often, you, you need to some, some more steps in between. And this is where we go to point two, which we won't do here now um, due to time, but you basically go into a second round of ideation. Because if you think about it, when you, when you basically, for example, IKEA, when you have a showroom there, what changes, what do you need to do? What you need more delivery stuff, you need a different digitalization equipment. You need, you need your customers to behave differently and you need different partners, for example, for your IT system. You need to think about um, when you think in the circle, oftentimes how to get the products back. If you, if you don't have a, if, if you change your ownership and go to a performance-based model, you still need to ensure to get the, get your products back, you need to have partners to basically refurbish them or reuse them or whatever. So putting your ideas on the canvas and trying to make them work out is like a second ideation part. And then third part, when you have your ideas on that canvas, you basically try to assign roads because what happens, as I said before, not one company can do everything. And by having that interest, your, your good ideas on that, you can see, okay, which roads will do or implement these patterns and these aspects, which roads are needed to fulfill that loop and to, to create that circle, and thereby also identify which are the most crucial ones. As I said before, maybe the recycler already recycles the material you have in use, so you need to just design your product for better disassembly or so on. Um, but there are maybe other partners who are very, very crucial to your ecosystem, to your future ecosystem. And then you have to think about, will we do it ourselves? Or will we basically um, need them to partner 
uh, who need a strong partner with that, and then you can start to reach out to them. And when you when you have assigned these roles and seen which ones are important, take a look at it, and oftentimes you still see some gaps if you really really think it through step by step. And that is where we oftentimes it comes in handy that you have more ideas than you put on the canvas. We oftentimes come up with with multiple canvas um, and try to make it work and have your your whole loop. Um, as basically your 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 goal, your target, which has of when you work in a group, many many different interesting ideas and and concepts in there that you then can take forward and start to assess with potential customers, with potential partners, to basically make sure that what you create here is not only sustainable and interesting, but also um, satisfies their needs, basically. So when you've noted your ideas on that canvas, you see, and this is why we, we can cannot be completely um, do that, obviously, in four minutes. It takes a much, much longer time. But basically, it could look like that. For IKEA, where you have thought about um, design, some multifunctional modular furniture that you need to improve this and reassembly, and basically have some parts you could you could focus on repair manuals and offering more and more easily spare parts offer, and that's what they're doing right now, secondhand and reuse. So they started some some pilots to reuse their own products. And you have all these ideas, and then you basically see they also use rice straw waste as an input, for example. And then you can take these ideas and see what can we do, what does our partners need to do, for example, the, the unique providers um, who use that rice straw for IKEA to make it into, into building materials that you can use. And you also see, okay, where are some issues? How do people currently and will return their products to us? Now it's a pilot, but how can we make sure that that is very easy for them in the future? Or how could we leverage existing secondhand markets? And combining that, getting a, a full, full, full solution overview um, need, means that you have some more steps to do, obviously. That is a design step, right? And um, we have a, created at the University of St. Gallen a circular navigator, basically, that covers it in seven steps. That's basically the structure. And Kasper has talked about impulse and identify. Um, we have bit done the identification of your current business model very briefly nowadays on the business model level. We use the pattern cards to ideate and we integrate these ideas on, a, on the circular canvas on ecosystem level. We have 40 patterns. Um, Clara already, already said uh, at circularnavigator.com you can, you can um, get them. There's also the white paper to download where you have them all listed with the examples so you can use them. And we're working right now on the digital version for the future. Next step after integrate, as I've said, you have your vision and you know which partners you need. You need to have a, yeah, we call it imagine. You need to create a vision that unifies all actors basically. They need to work together. So you need a common vision to align your management internally as well as externally and have to coordinate all the future partners. And what's very important is that we have iteration steps. So it means then next step would be incorporate getting partners on board. You might have started with some already. You might need new ones that you identify and find based on what you envision them to do as a role and which business ideas and the ideas you came up, you want to implement for them. But then also need to incorporate their aspects and vision, and thereby that ecosystem develops and improves um, further and further. And therefore, for incorporate, um, you have to add, think about the time perspective. Long time perspectives are difficult for companies. Orchestrate, I already talked about. And what we I see very often, companies need to move beyond their own border with ideas that are still very early stage and many struggle with that because they want to move out and say okay we have that it's done because they have a certain reputation but it's important to be open and to to talk early with potential partners because a lot will change you your first canvas is basically a starting point and you should stop thinking about competitors and more about partners 
because you see that in that area a lot. For example, Loop works with many brands and many brands try to, to work on reverse logistics together because they cannot handle it on, your, on their own. And the last step, implement, realizing that solution, creating that. Then we're back from the ecosystem level to the business model level, where each company and each partner needs to basically implement and realize that solution. So they need to adjust their business models in interaction and in accordance with the ecosystem that you together generate. And um, basically that oftentimes involves a lot of cultural change along the way, because you need to be more open, you need to set up different metrics and guidelines and so on and so on. And basically test the business model in each phase by itself. If we're talking about different, some products have 10 years of lifetime and, and more. So you, you really need to help your partners who are basically at the end or that's yourself, I don't know, um, to assess whether that works for them. So prototyping, MVPs, and assumption-based discovery are very, very important here. And as we are running out of time now, we are at the end. So I hope we gave you a quick overview of some of the tools, of some of the over, of some of the process steps you need to do. We really want you to work with that working sheet um, use the patterns, for example, and um, take a look at, um, at, the, at the, uh, the working session from, from Casper again, check uh, where your biggest issues and hurdles are, so that as a next step, you can use the content and approaches from the working sheet, and also we will share the recording and slides with you at your company. Maybe start a conversation with some of the ideas you now generate or some of the aspects you have. Or if you are already in, in progress of that, try to use this concept to systematically move, move forward. We will send you an email with the recording and the slides. And as we said before, the Mentimeter results and also the working sheet again. And please feel free to reach out to us. We are very interested in having conversations with you about what you do and, and how you do with the specific issues you have and what are your challenges, hurdles, and, and how do you want to tackle these problems? With that, um, we are at the end of our, of our workshop. Kasper, you're muted. Um, we hope you, you enjoyed it and you, 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 the, the interactiveness and you really worked on your working sheet. So if you have some ideas there and want to share it with us, please feel free here. Yes, thanks, Richard. Also from my side, thanks everyone so much for joining. It's been really fun to go through this with you and hopefully we can connect on this going forward and um, yeah, inspire you a bit to take this also forward within your respective organizations. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Looking forward to hear from you, interactiveness, you know, and we also learn a lot from, from your feedback and from what you already do and your thoughts. That's very important for us. So digest it feel free to come back to us next week probably and enjoy the weekend quite soon and thanks for joining and participating and um have a great day bye bye and thank you thanks all bye